Regarding Men, Episode 32, The Gift of the Masculine Side of Healing. <laughs> hey everybody, Paul Elam here with A Voice for Men and An Ear for Men. I'm with the inimitable Janice Fiamingo and of course the irreplaceable Tom Golden. And today we're going to talk a little bit about Tom's work. And I'll tell you why I wanted to do this. Let me start off with just with a little story. I started online activism or writing about these issues and putting it online a little over 10 years ago. And I focused a lot on the problems that I saw. Uh, unfairness in family courts, men's suicide, all these things that we still talk about 10 years later. Uh, that are still overarching problems in men's life. And I ran across the work of, of some other people. Angry Harry was one of my favorites. I used to read that site. Poor dear Harry passed away. Uh, we still maintain his site at angryharry.com, by the way. Uh, ABFM does. But back during that time, I started poking around on YouTube. And this is when men's issues really very first started getting mentioned on YouTube. And I stumbled on a video called just called men's issues and i was immediately enamored with the guy's voice that was doing this video uh, this just like like a mixture of honey and bourbon this voice coming through uh but also you know we talked a lot back in the day like i said about men's problems and stuff but i noticed this guy's byline was men are good is something actually a positive, proactive statement about men. And I was used to saying men are fucked, men are screwed over, <laughs> men are in trouble, but I wasn't saying men are good. And so I saw that and I really wanted to give this a listen. And the thing that I still stands out that there was a turning point for me from that video, and I've never told Tom this, it was a turning point in the way I viewed things and way I approached things, when he said, you know, and I don't remember verbatim except for part of it, that, that often we misconstrue that men's lives are about power and control, and really they're about pain and loss. Yeah. And I just stopped right then and there emotionally, and that hit me right where it counted that this was i mean it was a story of my life it was a story of, of most of the lives of the men that i had known and certainly the guys that i was writing about and advocating for in my work that their lives focused around pain and loss and tom laid out that and all the rest of the other issues in a very very clear and concise way uh, i still go back and watch this video every once in a while and that was really what introduced me to tom golden uh, was that experience and it was a great one and has proved to be great in all yeah. the years since so I, I just wanted to toss that out there and this is why I thought it was important that we do have one of these discussions about Tom's work and why he approaches it the way he does what exactly he does because it's very different than what I do and what, what other advocates do and it's very needed very very important and with that, I just want to throw that out there and maybe let Janice have a round, and then we can start with some questions for Tom about what he does. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a wonderful endorsement. Yeah, that's, thank you, Paul. Yeah, that's really it. nice to hear. Yeah, mm -hmm. all true, definitely. Yeah, well, my I think my um, my first my introduction to uh, to Tom's work was when I read Swallowed by a Snake. Um, that he sent me when he learned that my father had died uh, a couple of years ago and uh, Swallowed by a Snake, uh, the subtitle is, if I'm remembering correctly, The Masculine Gift of Healing. Is that right, uh, Tom? Yeah, and um, it's so readable and concrete and helpful. I, I just, I read it from first to last immediately and I, I just loved it. It interspersed with personal narrative and lots of uh, practical suggestions and uh, historical overviews of how other cultures uh, deal with healing. And yeah, it's, it's just amazing. I really, really liked it a lot. And what I especially liked was the way it seemed to be uh, almost entirely grounded in um, like practical experience, the experience of talking to men about healing 
and uh, gradually uh, discarding perhaps theoretical norms that you had been taught through counseling uh, and finding ways that worked, finding ways of healing that actually worked for the men that you were working with. That was what so impressed me about it. Although I think I, I saw a little smidge of, if I'm remembering correctly, Joseph Campbell in there, maybe some yeah. of his, his ideas. But, yeah. but other than that, it seemed to be, you know, really grounded in experience rather than in theory. And uh, I, I was so impressed by it. Could you talk a little bit about that, Tom? Oh, uh, Thank you, Janice. I mean, an endorsement from an English professor. I mean, what more can you ask for? Oh. And from the alpha, I'm, I'm floating here. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, the reason I said that, Paul, in that first video was because my whole history had been with men in loss. You know, I started back in the 1970s working with men who were in crisis. And the reason I did that was because no one else would take me. It took me a year to find a job and find out this one place that, that I would accept me was a center for death and dying. So I went into this place and, and I got a caseload of men immediately. <laughs> because there were 17 therapists there who were all female and I was the one guy. So I get this caseload of men, 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 every place, right? I had a couple of women and for the women, everything I'd been taught to do in graduate school worked like a charm. It was great stuff, you know, I sit and listen, you make eye contact, you talk about the past, you talk about your feelings and an hour would go by like that, right? The men, when I did what I was taught to do in grad school, eh -eh. Something wasn't working. It just wasn't working. So I had to at that point. I had so many men. I had to figure out what the hell was going on. And the first clue that I got was when I bumped into this cross-cultural research, this anthropological research on, on healing and grief and, and of indigenous people. And what I noticed right off the bat was that, oh, shit, these indigenous tribes always give the men something to do after a loss. They give them an action to do, and they give the women a place to emote and to talk. And I started thinking about that. I thought, wow, that's crazy. And then I realized, holy shit, in our culture, we've subcontracted all of the activities. You know, if it's the, making the casket, somebody else does. Digging the grave, somebody else does. The ritual stuff, somebody else does. Taking care of the body, somebody else does. All of it we've subcontracted, which has lived, left men without an ability to do something after a death, you know? And so I realized, holy crap, we've really put men in a terrible spot. And I started watching men and watching what they do after a loss. And it became so clear, Paul, that they just, what men do is they move towards action. They move towards doing something, just like these indigenous men did. They'd move towards doing and it was invisible. Most people could not see it. And let me tell you a story. 1993, uh, Michael Jordan, his father died. He was murdered. His father was murdered. And Jordan, of course, was one of the most greatest basketball players ever to play in the NBA. Just fantastic player. But his father was murdered. Two months after his father's murder, Jordan had a press conference. And he said, I'm quitting basketball. Of course, everybody's, oh, no, don't quit, Michael. Please keep playing. I love this guy. I mean, I was from the University of Maryland. He was from North Carolina. So I saw him all the time in the ACC, and he beat us the crap out of us all the time, right? But I still loved him because he was so good, just so fluid, just like butter, man. Two months later, he said, no more. I'm, I'm not going to play basketball. Two months after that, he called another press conference. He's going to play professional baseball. Everyone was like, what the hell? What's Jordan doing playing baseball? That doesn't make any sense. And most people still to this day don't know why he switched over to baseball. But he switched over to baseball because of his father. His father had always wanted him to be a baseball player. His father told him over and over again, you'd be the best baseball player in the world. You know, you need to play baseball. Mm -hmm. So Jordan honored his father with his action after his father's death. And through that action and that honoring, he told the story in his own mind about his father and his love for his father. Because he had been very close to his dad from the time he was little until he was an adult. They loved each other. So it was a huge loss for him. But this action is chronicle in some ways. The book Rebound by Green, I think, talks about Jordan. When he'd drive into practice, he would think to himself, I'm driving into practice not for me, but for you, dad. I'm here for you. 
And so that's a masculine mode of grief. That's a masculine mode of healing, this putting action out there, doing something and honoring in the process of putting it out there. And Jordan just gives us a beautiful example of the mature masculine. And importantly, you cannot see it. People still throw their hands up and say, why did he play baseball? They have no idea why he played baseball. And most men out there, and the reason this is important is that it's not just when we grieve for someone who's murdered. It's every day when we experience some loss or another, we tend to process emotions differently from women. You know, whether it's the being in a traffic jam is a tiny loss. We process that differently from women. Being, um, getting fired from a job is a huge loss for men, you know? And God, divorce, I mean, that's one of the biggest. Loss, loss, and more loss. Men will tend to use action then to connect in with their emotion around that and to let it go. I know this one guy, man, after he was divorced and they were selling the house, the house was getting ready to be sold. And he went, when no one else was there, he went to this house in each bedroom, each of the kids' bedroom, he laid in, those, in, in their bed and just laid there and cried. You know, He was doing that. He was actually making a pilgrimage to this house in honor of his kids and remembering all that happened through this action. Nobody knows he did that. Nobody has a clue. But was he dealing with his feelings? You bet he was. And are men shamed on a daily basis because we're not dealing with their feelings? Absolutely. I mean, think about toxic masculinity. One of the linchpins of toxic masculinity is he's not dealing with his feelings. Well, let me tell you something. That whole idea of men not dealing with their feelings is basically narcissistic. You know, because they're thinking that only women have the right way to do this. Only we do it right. You should be doing it like us. That's a crazy stuff, eh? So it's good to learn about men and how they do things, both men and women. God, I've given workshops all over the place, you know, therapists and women and whatever, and they all say the same thing. They say, holy crap, I never knew this stuff. I never knew that he did something through action. I always thought that he just didn't cry enough. And from that point forward, things shift. Because she knows now, you know, think about Michael Jordan. If you wanted to help Michael Jordan, would you go to him and say, Michael, how are you feeling about your father? No, 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 no. It's so simple. You go to him and say, Michael, how are you doing at the baseball yard? What's happening with baseball, man? How's it doing? You know, he'd talk to you about that. And guess what? During that conversation about what he's doing, his action, his dad would come up. In the same way, his dad would come up in a damn support group, you know? So you talk with men about their action, not about their feeling. And the feeling will come up. It'll come up on its own. And that's what I learned that helped me in therapy a lot was, you know, you don't sit with men and talk about their feelings. You don't make great eye contact because what does eye contact mean for two men? It means challenge. Aggression. Aggression. Yeah, yeah, it means put them up, pal. Hockey has a face-off, right? Boxers face each other. And so when I was at St. Francis, I was looking into this guy's eyes, you know, oh, no. No, it was the exact opposite thing I should have done, right? Because men don't heal face-to-face. They heal shoulder-to-shoulder. Men get close to other men when they're shoulder-to-shoulder doing a, a dangerous project of some sort. Army, police, fire departments. You know, that's where men feel close in a fishing boat doing the same activity for a day. Men walk away without saying a word, feeling close to that other guy. You know? That's so neat. Don't let me preach too long. I've gone on too long already. No, that's all right. Uh, You know, Uh you you talked about how we have subcontracted all of our tasks around that. And I wanted to maybe get into that a little bit more because it seems to me that what what we've done is we've, We've subcontracted out all of our rituals. Yes. We, we just, you know, there used to be coming of age rituals for men and for women too, depending on the, on the culture you were in. Yep. But there was something that you, an ordeal you went through, a task that you would go through that would mark your departure from childhood into adulthood. And we have literally stolen those rituals from men in our culture, for the most part. I mean, still Jewish people still have bar mitzvahs, but other than that, there's just, I mean, almost no rituals whatsoever. We have subcontracted them out. Yes. I'm wondering if your story about Michael Jordan, if he was creating his own ritual. Of course, that's exactly what men do. 
They create their own ritual. They create their own space. And most people cannot see that. And the men out there listening, think back, guys, when you had a loss, what did you do? I'll bet you a dollar to a donut. You did something to honor whatever it was that happened in one way or another. Yeah, man, we've lost those rituals. We've lost a lot. And, uh, and you know, we've, we've given ourselves up for, for the uh, Industrial Revolution. You know, we've moved away from that community and those rituals into a place. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Because I think that's a huge piece of this. I don't think yeah. there's anything... Yeah. Even counting feminism, God. nothing has impacted the lives of men and all people like the Industrial Revolution. Man, 170 okay. years ago, Paul, we had rituals. We yes. had black armbands. We had wreaths for the door. We had bereavement stationery where people would write letters, notes on stationery. I've been trying to get in touch with Facebook and say, look, here's what you can do. Just put a little black band around a person's profile if they ask for it that says they're grieving. Because see, all these rituals, what do they do? They let people know, you know, here I am grieving. The White House did uh, bereavement stationery. They had bereavement handkerchiefs, you know, where you'd have this black hanky. The women's hanky was, was uh, uh, had lace all around it. The depth of the lace told how long that person had been grieving. I mean, all of these things, and the man's hanky was flat black just flat black, but people could tell. He pulled out that hanky. Oh, that's right. So-and-so died. It's a reminder. All of these little things added up. And we lived in communities then too. So, you know, we weren't in like, like chocolate drop little places where, you know, people didn't even know each other. You know, these communities helped each other and they knew each other. And you make sure that the neighbor's kids were, you know, doing okay. And we had these rituals that said, oh yeah, Jim, his father died six months ago. Yeah, so we don't have that. We're stuck. <laughs> but men being the creative creatures that they are do yes. find ways. Man, and so much creativity, Paul. I'm telling you, since I realized this stuff, it's been wonderful to watch men and what they do. And the other thing you can't see is that a lot of the times men won't use action, they'll use inaction. That is, they will tell the story in their own brain. So they are not talking about it, but they're saying the same thing in their mind over and over and over again. You know, a lot of times guys, when they're driving, they're going to do what I call grind on it. They grind on that loss. They grind on it. They keep thinking about it. And by keep thinking about it, they're actually telling the story, which then brings that loss down, brings it down a click or two. And so men are, are wonderfully creative in the ways they do things. And the inactive is even harder to see. No one sees it. What are you going to do is say to someone, oh, were you thinking about so-and-so? <laughs> you know, you, you can't do that. You know, we don't know how to approach people to ask for the masculine side of things. Because really, you know, there's probably about 20% of women who will also use this action and inaction. And 20% of men who are more like the female. So it's not like it's a man-woman thing. It's kind of a blend, you know, we all have a blend of things and it's, uh, it's out there, you know, if you can just see it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, it's amazing to me when I was reading your book, I was thinking, you know, how, how is it that we, well, I mean, we know to a certain extent how it is that we got to a place where all of psychotherapy is <sighs> towards, you know, feminine ways of dealing with things, feminine ways of dealing with loss or, or or pain and I just wonder why is it I mean you may, you may not be able to answer this question but why is it that you were able to recognize the limitations of your training it sounds like you recognized it fairly early on yeah. and it sounds like in general there has been just this incredible resistance for this yes. whole period while you've been trying to talk to people about how psychotherapy needs to change in order to be able to engage men. So why were you able to see it? What and, and what? How did you do it? I mean, you mentioned reading the stories of indigenous cultures and and you know how they put men to work through their their rituals around loss. But um, what was that? It like you read no, that? You know, number what? one, number one was luck. You know, I think I got lucky bumping into things and things kind of came to me. Um, but another piece of this <clears throat> is that I worked at a center for death and dying. 
So I didn't get addicted to the DSM, you know, because you don't worry about a DSM when you're dealing with death and dying. You're working with a dying patient. You're thinking about how can I help this person today? You're not thinking about the diagnosis. um, For those that don't know, we better tell them the DSM is a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders. Yes. And it's got all. And so when you go to a regular counseling center, everyone, you know, is up on the DSM and who's got what and what someone's diagnosis is. And I didn't have to deal with any of that crap because grief and death, you don't have to worry about that. I think there was one V code for, for grief. It was that that's all there was. And I didn't give a crap about all the rest of it. That and I got a bird's eye view to what men do when they are in huge crisis. I mean, I worked with people, gosh, these men, one guy's whole family died in a house fire. It's like, it was that kind of crisis and it's raw. And so I got to see these guys for usually for a while because they'd stick with it for a while. And so I got to learn how they would do things. And once I saw the indigenous stuff and I started thinking about the action, it became easier than to see what people would do. And I would suggest people, in fact, gosh, it, it's so much fun in therapy to suggest to men, you know, I wonder if that action isn't really helping you in, in dealing with the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Damn right. Damn right. You know, it's like, it's just so much, it feels so good to really help men affirm that what they're doing is right because men have been shamed for so fucking long you know, for not dealing with their feelings, that they need to be affirmed for what they're doing. And men are doing this right. You know, they're doing it right. Most men, uh, some men are probably, you know, who knows what. But the men I've run into are doing things right. I think we've got to acknowledge, I mean, and I certainly would hope you'll correct me if you think I'm wrong, that, you know, the masculine way of dealing with loss isn't a tremendously easy one in a lot of ways. It, it is difficult, and I, I think it speaks sometimes to the suicide rate and depression rate and alcoholism that we see in men that centers around loss. But that is the way of men. It, yes. it, it's a harder way to go. Uh, but what I've seen happen, and I know I've heard you talk about this before, Tom, is that rather than recognize men where they are and how they actually do things, the profession, the psychological profession, has said, well, it, they're just defective women. Right. And we need to get them into the feminine mode, uh, which does more damage <laughs> by far, because what does it do? It shames them. Yes, exactly. And that pushes them farther away. You know? And Did in, you in encounter my... a lot of that in, in your Oh, in your God. Contemporaries? All the time, Paul. Not from the therapist, because the therapist I worked with were all dealing with grief and, and loss. Of course, they didn't want to deal with the men, you know. So, yes, in some ways, they, they were doing that. But And they did have comments about men don't deal with their feelings and men are cold and blah, blah, blah. But uh, not, not so much from my own perspective from that counseling center. Since then, you know, getting out with other people and being in other centers, it's pretty obvious, you know, that, that people just do not understand men. And they don't want to, you know, mm-hmm. sad. And in my, in my book that follows the one that Janice talked about, The Way Men Heal is this little teeny book. It's about 58 pages long. And it's an encapsulation of what I really learned. And, and part of that book is the five reasons that men um, do take action rather than inaction or rather than interaction. And there's five really good reasons for that. And the book goes into that. And the first one, of course, is that a man's pain is taboo. Nobody wants to hear that shit. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got a woman around you who's willing to listen to your pain, you, you're a, a unicorn, you know, because it doesn't happen very often. Women are not built to listen to men's pain. It, it grates on them, you know, just like it grates on men too. And so men pick this up and they realize, I got to do this myself. And they do just fine. You know, they process it just fine on their own. Yeah. Yeah, I was fascinated um, that you mentioned that there is actually a physiological reason, um, at least one, why men deal with... Boy, there's all kinds of physical reasons that that the second book and then the mother's book goes into in much more detail, you Mm -hmm. know, about how the testosterone, just in the last five years, we've come way ahead in understanding testosterone used to be they thought testosterone aggression, testosterone aggression. But now they know, uh uh-oh, it's that the aggression raised the testosterone, 
not the testosterone <laughs> raising the aggression. And so what they found is that testosterone is about striving for status. It's about striving for status and protecting that status once you get it. And this is very different. And, and once we know that, we can understand men better because, gosh, men love to come in first. I mean, we, we strive for status. We enjoy that. And it's a little deceiving because not all men are going to strive to be in the Pro Bowl, you know. I mean, some men, academics, are going to strive for the best um, journals, getting their articles in the best journals. You know, that's striving for status. You know, whereas the sports guys will go for the, the all-star game and the, the, uh, the criminals will go for the best crime of the century, you know. I mean, but it's just a matter of striving for status and how we do that. And it does have some rather interesting side effects, like no longer living in caves and grass huts. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. This, this whole hierarchy thing has gotten us to where we are today. Bless its heart. I mean, it's good. It's a good thing. And of course, it gets shamed over and over again. Oh, those men, they have to win all the time. All they think about is winning. La, 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 la. There's this huge misunderstanding about men, and the media doesn't do any good at all. All they do is focus on women's stuff, you know, very little on men stuff. And hopefully that's going to shift if this White House Council on Boys and Men happens, and it looks like it will. So wow. that's what happens with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've had a lot of experience, of course, trying to get <laughs> people in government to care <laughs> about men's pain. And that's the story that you told in my book, Sons of Feminism, of your experience yes. working with the uh, Maryland uh, Health Commission and yes. uh, the, the refusal there to <laughs> even yeah, the, release a report. The commission wrote about. four reports in our two years. Three of them were written by me, and one was written by the head of the commission. And the one written by him went straight through. The ones written by me somehow got deep sixed. <laughs> I, can't why that happened. I can't imagine either, except that the whole <laughs> Department of Health was as feminist as you can get. They took one mm -hmm. look at those reports and they said, uh uh. And anybody, by the way, if you're interested, you can read those reports, menaregood.com. Um, there's a little thing in the top that says reports, Maryland reports. Mm -hmm. They're pretty interesting stuff. But that's what they didn't want to have the governor see, you know, or the legislators see. So, Tom, I'd like <coughs> to ask you a question out of curiosity. What is the one thing that working with dying patients did? Because I. I Oh man! I can't imagine such a profound experience. It did so many things for me, Paula. I, I'm so glad that I bumped into that and was forced, really, into working with dying people. Because I'll tell you what it did for me. I'd go home after a day's work. I'd see my kids and I'd start crying. I'd say, "Oh, here you are. I'm breathing. You're breathing." Yes. I mean, it really made me enjoy my life every freaking day. You know, because these people I loved that I was working with were dying. And a lot of them would die, you know, boom, gone. And so it made me appreciate life. Oh, Bill went, used to say, used to say something like, uh, dying puts us in touch with living. You know, when we can really be in touch with dying, we start being able to know how to live and to squeeze the juice out of life, to love it, you know, to be it and to love the people around you. That's what death will do for you. Well, that's fascinating. Mm. Yeah. And in your book, uh, Tom, you talk about the, the distinction between depression and dealing with, with grief, dealing with pain yeah. and loss. And yes, yes. Two different I mean, things. Yeah, yeah. And it's complicated, but the general gist is that, you know, when someone's depressed, usually it has to do with negative thoughts in one way or another. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking negatively about themselves. Whereas loss, dealing with loss, um, it's, it's not, you're not saying you're a bad shit. You know, you're not saying you're a terrible person. You're just, you're, you're sad. There's so much sadness that you're weighed down. You know, sadness, sadness, <laughs> we talk about teaching children. In fact, the mother's book that I did, the Helping Mothers Understand uh, Boys, um, which was a book that I wrote because I saw all these mothers out there that don't have fathers in the house. You know, so I wanted to help them understand their boys a little bit. And so one of the things we did was teach them about feelings. The book talks about how do you teach a boy about feelings, you know? And what we talked about was you teach them about the body because almost always it's the body that will help the boy understand his emotions. You know, what happens 
when his body's feeling down and he's pulled down and he's feeling like this, he said, most likely. When he's every up in the air, like after a touchdown, yay, he's feeling better, you know. When he is anxious, he's probably breathing very quickly. When he's angry, he's probably breathing in a way that is staccato. He's holding the breath. So if you teach him these correlates, he starts to get the emotions in a better way than if you just said, now, here's what feeling is. You know, because <laughs> boys, it's hard for boys to get that because they're not in, in touch with things in the same way girls are. They don't have that same biocomputer. Tom, you mean you don't want to do the point to the emoticon on the page? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could try that one. You could try that one. But really, you know, boys are in their bodies. They're in their bodies. And they know what's happening in their bodies. And so it's much easier than to go into there. In fact, God, I've had adolescents come into me, you know, and uh, you'll sit and I say, fuck, fuck me, fuck me. And I could say, oh, what are you feeling? You know, <laughs> no, man, what do you feel in your body right now? What's going on? He's like, my fucking arms feel tight. I, I can't. I, clench my teeth. I say, well, what happens when people feel their body like that? I'm pissed. I'm fucking pissed off. And then he goes on. He, he gets it. He understands it. Then he, he can go on for a while because he's got it in the body first and then the mind, not the opposite way. You know, for men, it's easier if you go from the body out rather than the mind in, you know? Yeah, and boys love it too. I mean, they'll they'll enjoy that. And you know, what do you do for a boy? Work him out. Get that boy worked out. Once he's worked out, he's going to be much more able to sit and kind of be with you in a different kind of way. Give him something to do instead of a box of Kleenex. You'll get absolutely, off. absolutely. Give him a cord of wood to chop. See yep. what happens. Yeah, man. Yeah, and the thing, <laughs> the other thing that struck me too, reading about the the whole process is how long it can take yeah you know that whole yeah. i like your metaphor of swallowed by a snake and the idea of chipping away at the eating pieces of the snake yes by little by little until you finally kill the snake yes and, and uh you know and it seemed to me that that's such a suggestive analogy or <laughs> allegory whatever it is uh, yes. you know, of, of how long it takes and also what you have to do because what you're doing is like you're taking the grief the loss the pain inside yourself until you finally integrate it in yes. a way that enables you to, to keep going yes and janice is talking about a story uh, that's called swallowed by a snake that's about a flute player that gets swallowed up and the importance of that story is that once he's swallowed by that snake, he keeps at it and he takes one little chunk at a time, one little chunk at a time over and over and over again. And that's what we have to do with loss. That's what we have to do. You know, you have Jordan had to go up there. The catchers would tell Jordan what pitch was coming. They'd say where it was going to be and he still couldn't hit it. But, you know, it's like, God bless his heart. Oh, me. I think it's important too. I'm going to throw this in there because, you know, a lot of times in the course of therapy, what we're really dealing with is loss. Even when yes. it's dead, yes. it can be the loss of good parenting, oh. the, the, the loss of fair treatment in the home. And yes. that sets up a long grief process yes. for people. And yes. I love the analogy that Janice brought up because that lets you know it's okay to take your time. Yeah. This, is, this is very big stuff. Yes. And almost all therapy comes down to grief in my yes. experience. Yes, and I agree. If, if you get a, a little bit at a time and move on and don't expect yourself to be healed overnight or to get over the anger overnight or any of this stuff, it makes the process a lot easier. Yeah. You know, I've got a healing playlist on my YouTube channel, Men Are Good, that uh, I think I've done four there, which kind of starts out talking about men and how we heal differently. And it, I haven't gotten to the uh, one for... Uh, the testosterone and, and the precarious manhood yet, but, but uh, that might be something you could check out. And on my Patreon site, I've got all the old videos I used for this international grief class I taught, which is maybe 15 videos or so that go into more detail about all these different losses and what happens. Yeah. A little yeah. plug. 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Did you mention Tom's Patreon? Look in the low bar. You will find a link to Tom's Patreon where you can and should, I would dare say, support his work. Um, uh, this is important stuff, and we only have one Tom Golden. Oh. Yeah, That's absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I mean, your, your, your work is, is really uniquely affirming, I think. And, well, you know, the whole you. idea, the whole idea that, you know, even in the title of that one book, that masculinity is, a, it brings a gift, that masculine yes. ways of doing things, masculine ways of responding to the world, masculine ways of being a self in our society, yes. that those are all gifts. You know, that's, that's so obvious as soon as you start thinking about it, but it it's so much obscured in our Indeed. man man shaming culture and i Indeed. really appreciate that well thank yeah. you and you know i i just thought of it now that another reason why i understood things better was because my, my father mm -hmm. my father was a wonderful beautiful man who just loved me completely and when you have that you find out lots of things that other people can't find out yeah. I and mean, that i think that's the biggest privilege right there you know they talk about privilege a lot these days but man i was thinking about it the other day the real privilege is having two parents who love you if you've got that, I don't care what race you are, how much money you got. If you've got that, man, that is privilege, you know? And if you don't, you can learn to compensate for that. Yes. You don't yes. have to be stuck with that, the emptiness that bad parents leave behind. Yes. But it takes being swallowed by a snake and chipping your way out. So right. it's only a little bit at a time, but you will get out of it. You know, you're right, Paul. It's absolutely right. Do you mind if I help close us out with a little tale of the masculine side, the masculine gift? Oh, good. Let's hear it. Life, and this is much more meaningful to me now because of your work, Tom, uh, than it was even when it happened. When I lost my father, when mm -hmm. he passed away from Alzheimer's disease, um, I had every therapist I knew was calling me. You, you want to talk about your dad. You want to talk about your dad. Huh. And I was like, leave me the fuck alone. <laughs> I do not want to talk about my dad. I want you to quit fucking asking me. <laughs> and because that's not the way I'm a guy that does not do things that way. Well, uh, I, I knew this guy happened to be a Hispanic guy that I worked with off and on for years. And I met him for a beer. And he just said, how are you doing? And I said, you know, I'm, I'm doing all right. It's up and down. You know how these things go. And we never mentioned my father. And he got up from the, we were sitting at like a picnic type table, and he got up from it and walked over to my side, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said, can I get you another beer? And that's all it took. And the tear came out this side. I didn't need to display my emotions for him. I didn't need to make an exhibition of my grief. He knew my father had died and I didn't need to say it. That's all he needed to know in order to be present. And I think that's a great classic story. It was a very healing moment yeah. in, in my grief over my father. Yes. I think it's a very, very telling way that men connect to each other Yes, in ways that are different than is expected of women. Exactly. And, and, and your work, I think, highlights for people why we should honor that and encourage it yes. between men instead of saying, oh, look, Paul couldn't, you know, sit there and, and so soak up tears in a Kleenex and tell his friend all about his feelings. You know what? I didn't need to. Yeah. What you needed was that hand on your shoulder. That, that hand said, I care about you. This is a safe place for you. I'm with and you. He, and he didn't need to say all that. It exactly. Just, he didn't have to say one word. Just that yeah. hand on the shoulder said it all. Yep. And that's the way it is with men. A lot of times it's exactly the way it is. You know? Absolutely right. Good note to stop. Yeah, well, we, we still got to give away a humanitarian award. I don't think we've got a puta to hand out uh, this <laughs> week. <laughs> Well, well, we could always give out a puta. I know lots of <laughs> But I do think uh, in honor of your work, Tom, we should ab obviously uh, bestow the humanitarian uh, award on you for your stellar work with men mm -hmm. and loss. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah. thank you, Paul. I accept it and, and uh, I'll bask in that. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Janice. Good. And with that, I think we'll see you guys next time. We're done? That's yeah, good. Y'all take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.